Paolo, you're through to the National Health Service. What is the nature of your emergency? Historical. I'm sorry? If I don't learn the entire history of the National Health Service in the next five minutes, my head will literally explode. Well, there's no time to lose. I'm putting you through to a special department. This is a case for history bombs. Now, these are difficult times, and as the worst hits, we, we need the doctors, doctors and nurses. nurses. But you can put away your purses in the UK. Healthcare is free at the point of entry. Now, it didn't used to be this way. Back in the day, you had to pay. Let me explain. I will do my best. This is the history bomb of the NHS. Now, for me to bring you up to speed, we need to heed the creed of the father of medicine. Cut to ancient Greece to meet Hippocrates. He was a pretty cool gentleman. Yo, they call me Hippocrates. Watch me as I handle hip hop with ease. My medical flows echo through the centuries. Groundbreaking work on health and disease. Sweating on my oath, or reading in my corpus. My influence on medicine was frankly enormous. I care for all people. You can be sure. Doesn't matter if you're rich, doesn't matter if you are poor. Hippocrates laid the foundation for modern medicine and was an early advocate for universal health care, but he didn't found the NHS. Healthcare in England was initially provided by monasteries until Henry VIII got rid of those. Without monasteries, it was left to Henry's second daughter to figure out how to provide healthcare for the poor and the elderly. What up? It's Elizabeth I. Jeez, man, my father was the worst. Dissolving the monasteries? What was he thinking? Never mind, it's time for a new beginning. Now to the matter of the impotent poor. Let's raise taxation so we can procure relief for the needy and shelter for sure. It's a law for the poor, so I'll call it poor law. Elizabethan poor law set the tone for centuries to come, with the state providing some medical care for the poor and the elderly, alongside other charitable and private institutions. When it got to the Victorians, they thought the poor had it too easy and made some drastic changes with a now infamous institution. We pay too much tax the sick and the poor. They just laze around. What are they good for? Surely they deserve our Christian kindness. Oh, pull yourself together. That's quite enough niceness. I don't mind the poor if they work. We should afford them shelter, but not if they shirk. But where can they go if life doesn't work out? For their moral improvement. To the workhouse. Victorian workhouses were designed to be truly undesirable, and they were. Charitable hospitals did provide free health care for some, but medical care for the poor was generally, well, poor. In 1905, a royal commission was set up to review the existing welfare system. The commissioners' opinions were split, and they produced two very different reports. I'm Helen Bozen Kett, and I offer my support to the royal commission's majority report. Those in poverty and pain are morally feeble, and the workhouse is a fitting place for such people. Poverty is not a moral rupture, it's a logical result of society's structure. The state should provide much better support, signed Beatrice Webb in the minority report. It wasn't widely supported at the time, but the 1909 Minority Report, penned by Sidney and Beatrice Webb, was the seed that grew into their modern welfare state. A young William Beveridge was a researcher on the project, remember the name. In 1911, National Healthcare grew one step closer with the National Insurance Act. Look, I've just been to visit the Germans. They've got a great scheme going on for their workers. If the workers, employers and government combine, we can cover your health care so you'll always be fine. And if you get too sick to work, it covers unemployment, so that's a first. As Chancellor, I think that's a path we should forge. As that's all from me, David Lloyd George. The National Insurance Act was an important step, but it was limited to industrial workers only. In the same year, Dr Benjamin Moore wrote an influential book called The Dawn of the Health Age, in which he coined the phrase, a national health service. It would take another 30 years in a state of war for these formative ideas to finally find an audience. Now hurry, William, we're going to be late. One moment, I'm just founding the welfare state. All men and women will be respected as citizens and none shall fall below a national minimum. Well, that's rather good. Now, is it nice and short? There are 300 pages in my beverage report. Great, Scott. Well, we'll circulate it as we planned, though I doubt if your message will really land. The Beverage Report was a big hit at home and circulated to the armed forces all across Europe. It offered a war-weary nation hope for a brighter future. The wartime Conservative government formalised plans for a national health service in 1944, and in 1948, a Welsh Labour minister finally brought this radical idea to life. Back in Tredegar, in South Wales, there's a medical society that never fails. The members contribute a monthly fee, and at the point of use, the health care's free. That's what we need on a national scale. If we work together, we cannot fail. 
This is Britain at her best. I proudly open the NHS. And since it was opened by Nye Bevan, it has grown to become a bold expression for the welfare state. Strong and brave, looking after Britain from cradle to grave. In these troubled times, it still blazes away, building Nightingale Hospital in just nine days. To the NHS staff from the History Bombs crew, we'd just like to say a massive... Thank, thank you! you. Exploded at all? Um, no, no, actually. Oh, well, that's great news. Uh, you stay indoors and make sure you subscribe to History Bombs for any future medical historical emergencies of this very specific nature. I will. I will. Thank you. Goodbye. <laughs>